would like to set the record straight that I was moonlighting as a doctor. I'm not actually a doctor. <laughs> I'm a registered dietitian with a specialty in pediatrics. Um, but I, I appreciate the thought. <laughs> I appreciate the thought. Um, okay. uh, just a quick little slide on some of the things we'll cover today. We kind of talk a little bit about these. Um, but we really wanted to drive home the points we felt were very important today uh, for our visit here um, and things that can be improved upon. So we know the legacy, we call it the legacy diet for CF. We eat to gain, we gain, we live. Um, so in 1988, the first landmark paper um, associating high fat, high calorie diet with improved weight and survival was published. Um, then in 2002, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation was able to actually release official guidelines for that diet. Um, so we have these nice charts from the foundation. Um, these are very helpful when you're talking to parents, to when you're telling them that weight will improve their lung function, show them this graph. Um, we know that FEV1 increases as their BMI increases. There's been lots and lots of research on that. Um, our goal is always to get up to the 75th percentile on the hoop growth chart, and then when they move over to the CDC, that equates to the 50th percentile. Do we always get there? No, but we always try. And then for adults, that 50th percentile, when they're off the pediatric chart, equates to 22 BMI for females and 23 for males. Again, optimal lung function um, at higher BMIs. But you know, with caution, um, there is no evidence for improvement in lung function with high BMI, specifically in pediatric over the 85th percentile. We're gonna talk about salt and how important it is and how you have to really get on it here. <laughs> um, salt uh, is the first intervention you can do with a new baby. Um, the very first thing you can do before you increase calories, before you start enzymes, you need to make sure you're replacing the salt that they're losing. They're not gonna grow if you don't. Um, somebody earlier mentioned pseudobarter syndrome here. That's probably why they're contributing a little bit. You gotta give more salt to your babies. It's very, very, very important. Um, so they're at risk uh, for hyponatremia, for excess salt loss, hot weather, fever, warm home environment, excessive, excessive bundling of infants, I find it very strange coming from Michigan that your infants are in like snowsuits here <laughs> in this weather. Uh, but then as a CF dietitian, I worry even more, babies sweating more, losing more salt. Are we making sure we're replacing that? So also thinking from a CF standpoint. Whether or not um, your child uh, is pancreatic sufficient or, insufficient or sufficient or insufficient, every patient with CF needs salt and you need to make sure you're replacing it. We vary our recommendations based on age, um, but once we're past those infant years into toddler years, we have a high salt diet. It's not too hard in the Western diet to have a high salt diet. Um, our kiddos crave salt too. Um, their bodies are very smart. So what we like to do as clinicians is educate our families, um, the things that can come along with salt depletion, these are kind of non-specific symptoms, um, but we really want to push home the symptoms of you know, what you're going to see um, if your kiddo is low on their salt. Uh, in Michigan, really, for our kids, we have you know variable weather climate, but especially in the summer when they're active and when they're playing sports, really, really emphasize that. So this is how the first education we'll give to our families. I don't know if you have these packets here. Um, it's very easy for our parents to understand. Um, in hash. Do you know in hash? Mm. Hash measurement. When you go to the center of it, in Micah, yeah. They give them this salt uh, sachet as a. Mm. Okay. As a kid because. But, but for the people that are going to go Yeah, the um, so McDonald's has these. Yeah, so um, between zero and six months, um, CFS guidelines. Um, it's about 13 milliequivalents of a teaspoon per day for our families. Equating it to a salt packet is easy for them. Not everybody has measuring spoons at home to do an eighth of a teaspoon, 
plus uh, packaged salt travels well. Um, so having that, we tell them after the first visit, go home, stop at McDonald's on your way home. <laughs> Save you a lot. Um, and how do we do that? We're going to mix it in their bottles, if they're bottle fed. If they're breast fed, you can sprinkle it in the applesauce. Um, some kiddos, I, I haven't found very much success with this, but licking it off a finger or a pacifier. Um, but the most important part is making sure you're spreading it throughout the day. Um, even in our own NICU, they were giving our babies way too much sodium chloride. They um, do it as a solution when they're in the NICU and babies were vomiting. Guys, you got to spread it out. That's a lot of salt all at once. So that's important to remember too in telling our families. First feed of the day to the last feed of the day. Don't worry about it overnight. You're doing a lot overnight, so just make sure you get it in during the day. And then when we hit six months, we go up to a quarter teaspoon. We double it. That's two packets. And again, mixing in their bottles, their applesauce, whatever way family finds works best for them and the, the you children. Mix the sauce and the, the mix the mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you don't do a lot of it. It's just so, sprinkles. So in the day, yeah. so like, you know, mix a bit of like salt, yeah. one eighth of a teaspoon, so just a teaspoon. Yeah. Over the day. Yeah. yeah. Over the day. You can do it all at once, they're going to vomit. The child will not accept it. The baby will not accept it. You hold that. Uh, yeah. Well, about. So you don't want to give it Well, they're not going to drink it. They're going to vomit. And then you risk electrolyte disturbances that way. Um, so, no. Th yeah. And th so that's just education. Spread it throughout the day, just like you would salt your meals throughout the day. And then after they turn 12 months, be liberal, have fun. No longer need to measure it. Um, some of our families don't feel comfortable with that and they really like to know how much salt their kids get into the day and they stick with that quarter teaspoon and that's absolutely fine. Um, but obviously we wanna definitely be more, um, think about it in hotter weather when they're active. You guys are in a desert region. We wanna make sure you are in the desert. <laughs> uh, we wanna make sure they're getting the salt that they need. Very, very important. Um, and one thing to note, if you have a child who's growing or who's not growing, you've given them all the calories you can, they're on optimal PERT dosing. Um, there's really, you can't understand why they're grow not growing well, you can check the urine sodium. Sometimes we will do this, especially in our babies who have had a gut history or a resection. They don't seem to be growing, we'll check the urine sodium. They need more salt. So they need more than the guidelines. Um, just something to consider if you're still struggling with growth. Next thing we'll talk about is um, PERT, pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. We know that most of our individuals with CF are going to be pancreatic insufficient. I won't go through all this because we all, this was just talked about. Fat digestion is most effective and what we're most targeting with um, PERT therapy. Uh, we want to improve the symptoms of malabsorption, uh, promote adequate weight gain and growth, and prevent nutritional deficiencies. We know how this works, but it's a nice little picture. So here's what we have in the U.S. Um, this is a great visual for parents. I always say um, when we're going to give babies enzymes, these are kind of like dip and dots, if you've ever seen that little ice cream concoction. For our infants, we open the capsules. We put it in uh, an acidic medium in the U.S. That's applesauce. Here, that's not readily available. Um, so we'll talk about some other options, but these are the four different brands. There's not necessarily one that's better than the other. Creon and Zentep tend to be the ones we start with. Might just depend on what's on formulary in your hospital if they come from admission. Some beads are bigger than the other ones, so babies will do well sometimes with the Zentep a little bit better because there's less beads. And you can like divide it. When you're giving them a half enzyme, the parent can actually count out the beads versus like Creon or Perth C that are very, very small. Uh, the only difference with any of these enzymes is Perth C. We're not allowed to use that one to start because it's very expensive. That's because it has sodium bicarbonate in it. Um, the thought is that it'll help those enzymes work best when it gets to the duodenum uh, where the enzymes are supposed to be working. Um, so insurance will require us to trial and fail Creon and Zentep and sometimes even pancreas too before they'll let us get the PERC-C. But PERC-C is not the end-all be-all. Some patients do not do well on that. Um, so really you just have to find the one that works best for them. So we're gonna talk briefly about dosing. I know that someone already mentioned the 10,000 units of lipase of kilogram a day. You are going to beat that every single day when you're feeding infants. Infants feed at least eight times a day or more if they're breastfeeding or cluster feeding. 
So what we like to focus on um, so that we're not limiting our enzymes uh, is looking at the weight-based dosing, uh, 1,500 to 2,500 units per kilogram per meal per day. With our infants, we'll start very slow, half an enzyme, half of one 3,000, and then slowly work our way up. We find in clinical practice um, each kid has a different optimal dosing and where their symptoms um, are managed, but I would say between 1,700 and about 2,100 where we find our sweet spots with our enzymes. So I know the issue here is the lack of availability of a lot of enzymes to be able to properly dose, so we just have to work with what we have. Where, you know, can we have a bigger meal and use the enzymes there and then make sure we're just snacking on things that don't need enzymes. You just have to find a way to work with the family and what they've got and maximize how you can with what you have. And that can be challenging. Um, so that might mean more visits in between follow-up, trying to really work with the families. So we always wanna talk about proper use of the enzymes. Um, always, always, always at the beginning of a meal and with anything that's got fat in it. We want to make sure the kids don't swallow or aren't chewing them either. It's going to give them mouth sores and they're not going to work effectively. So make sure we're swallowing the beads whole. We do have one patient that chews her enzyme beads. She loves it. Absolutely loves it. Don't know how it does it make her mouth hurt. Been doing it for years. Don't recommend it. <laughs> so we're thinking if applesauce is not available here in Egypt, you know, what can we do? What can we give these enzymes with when we are not taking the capsule full? Um, and I was looking up just different acidic fruit that's available here, and certainly any of these could be a puree, apricot, guava, berries, prunes, plums, you know, anything you can, really anything you can get your hands on. Some are going to be a little bit more acidic than others. The idea of putting it in something acidic is to help it survive the stomach so it can get and work appropriately um, in the small intestine. You're never going to get 100% absorption with this because we're not taking enzymes the way our body intended, but we really want to try and get the most effectiveness, effectiveness out, of, out of them that we can. And it could be like one teaspoon or something. Not oh, yes. Yeah. And um, it, it's, uh, if you have a baby spoon, it's <coughs> literally the tip of a baby spoon. It's just enough to coat the beads. It's not a lot. Um, you know, even though we've been treating and taking care of CF at our center, it still mind boggles the NICU or mind boggles nurses or other doctors that we're giving our baby applesauce. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure it'll be okay. <laughs> um, but they just don't know. Uh, and it's important to educate our families, the timing. Um, these enzymes are good for 45 minutes up to an hour um, after taking them. And we find the best effectiveness before the meal. The only time we would consider maybe midway or at the end is if we have problematic eaters. Um, they're very slow eaters. Um, and so those are the reasons we would do that. But I would say 90, 95% of our kids always take them at the start of a meal. And after, if you're eating again, after an hour, you need to give another dose. But we don't try to encourage eating every hour. <laughs> Um, and we really want to make sure our families know too um, that we want to keep these en enzymes in a cool place. Um, you know, don't put them on the counter and the windowsill. Don't keep them in the hot car. Um, you don't have a big supply of them and you're limited on what you have. So make sure what you do have you're taking care of so they do work the most effectively. We'll touch briefly on pancreatic sufficiency. Um, we, like I said, most individuals are insufficient, but there are a few um, that are sufficient. I put it in bold. They still need extra salt. But I'd like to give you an example that we just recently had. Um, my first pancreatic sufficient patient, you don't get them often, she was not growing. Not growing, no linear growth, about two months old. I didn't do anything but give her salt, and she's like in the 90th percentile and everything now. That's because she's pancreatic sufficient, but it just proof that salt is key. It's the first thing you should be worrying about when you get a new infant. Start the salt, then start the enzymes, um, and then the vitamins. Um, consider rechecking fecally lactate if you're having clinical symptoms. So with our pancreatic sufficient patients, generally check for the first few years. Um, I think previously we've always been trying to check every year, but really you don't need to unless you have clinical symptoms. On occasion, um, a patient can move from sufficient to insufficient, 
and show clinical signs of that, it does not happen often though. But certainly we can repeat it. Given fecal elastase will give you is a pretty good result. It's not with you're taking enzymes or not taking enzymes, that's not gonna affect it. Really more the consistency or texture is what's gonna affect how um, good your results are. So we'd like to wait a little bit after the babies get started on enzymes. If you've seen a malabsorption poop, you've seen them all. <laughs> and so we know, especially based on their mutations, we don't wait for the fecal elastase, we're gonna start enzymes. We'll get that later. Um, for our pancreatic sufficient patients, we kind of want to aim um, in general for a good diet, keep working on weight gain and goals. They tend to grow better than our you know, pancreatic insufficient patients, but not always. Sometimes there's other factors in there like just picky eating that you can't control. Um, so not every pancreatic sufficient patient grows well, um, but you definitely want to keep your eyes on that. And then keep in mind they don't necessarily use CF vitamins with all those therapeutic dosing of fat solubles. Maybe a general multivitamin is just fine. Um, or maybe not even one at all if they're eating a very well balanced diet. So here are some vitamins that we use. Um, the NBWs are what we brought over, um, gave to families on Monday. Chris brought a whole other box with him too. It's not that we prefer MBW over DECA's. Um, we brought what we could have, what we got. <laughs> um, and there's not one that's better than the other. The dosing is fairly similar. Uh, the MVW is more concentrated, so parents like that because it's a smaller dose. But I will say clinically, some of our babies don't tolerate MVW, even when we split it into 0.25 um, twice a day. And then we'll switch to DECA's and they seem to do just better on that one. So. I don't preference either one. If um, parents are looking for the lower dose, MBW will do it. These fat solubles are very, very therapeutic levels of vitamin A, D, E, and K. Not, not something you're gonna find in any multivitamin. So you have to make sure you educate parents. We always have to educate our pharmacies. Oh, this is just polyvisol, a very general vitamin for infants. It is not. Very, very high dosing. And they also have B vitamins and zinc in there, um, zinc being a, a mineral that can, you can be low in with chronic diarrhea. So I'm just going to briefly touch on estimating energy needs. They need a lot of calories. Um, and talking with the nutrition team yesterday, um, you need to go up to 30 calories per ounce a lot in our babies. It is uncommon for an infant under our care to be on anything less than 24 cal. I think most of them are 26, 28, 30 cal formula um, to get them to grow because their needs are so great. Lots of reason why they have um, increased needs from malabsorption, increased work of breathing, a higher metabolic rate at baseline, uh, lots of other reasons. So. Um, the calorie requirements are approximately 1.2 to 2 times the RDA, uh, and protein up to 2 times. And we discussed this yesterday too, our kids can handle a lot of protein. Any baby, even without CF, can handle large amounts of protein. Um, unless you're a renal patient, it's not something that's harmful. Clinically, I've worked in other clinics, you need the calories and the protein to grow and the kidneys can handle it. So in our infants then, we like to just work with calories per kilo. It's proven time and time again um, to, to work appropriately. You can use lots of different predictive equations, but essentially keeping in mind our kiddos with CF who are pancreatic insufficient need more than what a standard infant would. 120 up to 160 calories per kilo. That's absolutely true. I see it in clinic all the time. Um, for reference, um, an infant full term only needs like 100 calories per kilo in the United States, so they need a lot. So we get very aggressive. Um, fluid needs usually match calorie needs. So the goal of estimating in CF, um, I don't kind of waste my time coming up with estimations. I know what they're at. I know I need to increase it. Um, and I, in my practice, that's how we do it. So how are we going to promote weight gain? Well, we're going to increase calories. Uh, we don't like to hold off, we don't like to wait, we absolutely know they're going to need more calories, but we do it systematically. They start on 20 cal breast milk, we fortify it, 2 cals at a time, see how they do, adjust their enzymes, see how they do. So it's not just, 
we go up, we go up, we're looking at the clinical picture and how much we need to go up to. We know that they need a high calorie, high fat diet, um, 35 to 40% of calories. Um, and so that's why fat, especially for children, is easy to get in because it's most calorie dense and it's not gonna um, increase the volume that they have to eat. So we use calorie boosters, oil, butter, extra cheese, sour cream, um, you, know, you name it, anything that's got calories um, is the name of the game. We also use oral supplements. I know you guys do too. Um, these are just the most common ones. Pediasure, Ensure, Lutrish is a newer shake. Um, but these mostly are always needed, um, especially with our babies who are having 30 cal infant formula. The toddler formula starts at 30 cal, so it's a nice switch over. Um, they're basically at a toddler level and they need this to supplement um, the food that they eat, even though they're on a high calorie diet, again, because their needs are so great. So thinking about how to promote weight gain, I always try to keep it simple with my family. Um, we have the great pleasure of having their supplements covered by insurance if they have the right type of insurance. But not everybody has that you know, available to them. Pediasure is expensive. So you can make high calorie shakes at home and it doesn't have to be complicated. Start with a milk base. Could be cow's milk, could be plant milk, whatever you choose. And then add yogurt or ice cream. And then you kind of go from there. Pick a fruit. Add more fat or protein. Use crushed peanuts or avocado. And then flavor it up. So this is, these are just the ideas. There's tons and tons. I know you guys have tons of recipes. Um, but try not to overwhelm families. Um, but these are simple ways to get extra calories in, again, without asking them to do a lot more volume. Kids have small bellies. Um, so asking them to do a whole shake three times a day, not necessarily going to happen. So when we, we've been here this week, we were asking, are you using appetite stimulants? Um, so no, and not a lot. Um, what we really, Dr. Nasser and I talked about, we really, really need to get more aggressive with appetite stimulants. They work. They have very minimal side effects. Um, and if it doesn't work, you can stop it. <laughs> but the name of the game is we need to get these kids to eat more. There's lots of reasons why kids don't eat. A lot of them related to GI manifestations. Um, Dr. Dancer wrote a great paper on this some years ago. Um, you know, we looked at the different medications that were available. Um, Periactin has been a great tool in our clinic and actually even across all of our multi-specialty clinics at Michigan Medicine. The F clinic's not the only one that uses it. Um, it works great, um, it's easy to do. The only real side effect we see is maybe being sleepy at night, but not every kid sees that. And then we adjust the dose as needed. It has this really nice background effect to improve their appetite, again, without asking us asking these kids to do more volume. So start using periactin as soon as you can. Other ways to help increase appetite, and you know, increase weight gain. Obviously, we're going to treat exacerbations. Dr. Nasser touched, um, you know, on the reflux medications. Certainly, they can help enzymes work most effectively, but it should not be the first thing that we do. Um, it creates a more alkaline environment, um, so it can be helpful. It can also help with oral intake if we have symptomatic or even silent reflux. But we really want to consider long-term, short-term. Do they need to have this? Um, as another medication, or can we hold off after a little while? Um, so yeah, it's an, another tool in the toolbox. And then really considering actual nutrition support, I don't think that that's really available here, or that's a well-accepted thing to do, um, but we do not hesitate to use it because these children need so many extra calories. Even if they're eating 3,000 calories a day, that's not enough for them to grow. And so we use enteral nutrition support as a tool to take the pressure off to get to their goals. And it's not permanent. A lot of families get very scared. There's a lot of stigmas about enteral nutrition and G-tubes. Um, as a dietitian who has worked across multiple subspecialty clinics, um, I praise G-tubes. They, they are a savior. Um, so just something else that can be useful. Enteral feeding, so I won't go too much into this. Um, but definitely it's a tool in the toolbox to get our kids to grow. So quality improvement. Um, so we a lot of our trips this time uh, looking at what we can do uh, for quality improvement. Um, so just kind of touch on what we did to show you how it can be successful. Um, so um, 
before my time in this department, there was a study, they went through and looked at BMIs and came up with a risk stratification, um, and I'll show you on the next slide what that is. Um, but essentially what they found when they targeted BMI less than 24th percentile with things like uh, periodic nutrition assessments, making sure the social worker, the psych psychologist sees them, doing the interventions, appetite stimulants, high calorie diet, internal nutrition support, getting feedback from the family advisory board. What we saw when we put all this together and put it in action is that BMI percentiles increased from a, me a median of 11.8 uh, to 22, almost a 50% improvement just by putting in this BMI algorithm. Um, there was no statistically, statistically significant changes in lung function, um, but could be several factors um, because of the size of the study and how long it was. So this is what we hope to work with with the nutrition department. This is what we have used um, to kind of identify where we need to focus our efforts at. You know, BMI at the 50th percentile, keep doing what you're doing, high calorie diet, whatever you're doing to support that, keep it up. But then when you see them, if they're below that 25, you know, to 49 percent, we're gonna, okay, we already have the high calorie diet, let's add on oral supplements, let's see if we can just get more calories in. Okay, that's not working, we're still going down, what else can we add on that? So, you know, depending on where they're at, what interventions can be appropriate, and I know you don't necessarily have all the ancillary support that we do, um, but, you know, tailoring it to your clinic and your multidisciplinary team, um, and we've already made improvements from last year, can we make them even better? And then just to say what we've done with Turkey, that again, these um, uh, QI projects work, um, I didn't work in Turkey, but my cohort um, did. Um, they now have two full-time registered dietitians there. They know how to assess and diagnose malnutrition. They're using the algorithm, the high calorie diet, the appetite stimulant supplements, optimizing enzyme dosing. Um, you know, they're doing all the things that we did and they saw improved FEV1 um, and improved weight and BMI. Um, so they are taking the ball and running with it, I should say. <laughs> they're doing very, very well. Um, so we are hopeful that you guys can do the same. Let's wrap it all up then. Uh, you know, thinking about nutrition, we know it's so, so, so important. Children who are undernourished and malnourished are at higher risk for contracting infectious diseases. Um, so this, is, this means in CF, they have a harder time fighting off lung infections. And so we really want them to maintain and gain um, and reduce their chances for exacerbations and improve their quality of life. Um, it's the first two years of life we know um, has improved outcomes. If we can have really good growth the first two years, that will kind of set the stage moving forward. This is why we are so aggressive, especially when they're under one, considering their brain development as well. I have no hesitation to move a baby from 20, 22, 24, up to 30 if I need to, to get them to grow appropriately. And they do well and they thrive um, and they do really good. Uh, and just remind, remembering that it's critical at diagnosis to emphasize why we push weight gain. We're going to push past their genetic potential because families will be like, well, I'm small, dad's small, that's great. Um, but for CF, we need to push beyond that potential for their lung function, for their overall outcomes, um, and just keep reminding them of that. They're not, nor should they, should they grow like you, they have CF, they need to grow a little bit different than you if we're going to have better outcomes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stacy, yeah. for your advice. And let's try to uh, hear the talks. Please, as a dietitian, make it easy to digest to our minds at the end of the day. <laughs> uh, and coming up to close the session, before closure, I have to thank all the elegant speakers. And I have to thank my dear sister, uh, Dr. Iman, for this nice, nice gathering. Uh, and I have to thank Dr. Samia uh, and her, her team. Samia, uh, remember us by all the immigrant Egyptians. They are our immigrant birth. They are trying to understand their experience in Egypt. Uh, and we, we find, and now we are, uh, have this time today. Before we start, we started our training together. Uh, uh, the uh, Arabs are immune against the tuberculosis. are now gathering for tuberculosis in Egypt. And I think we need to work at least every year a little bit by little. I think the result and the number of patients can find.